Well, good evening. It's my uh, privilege to welcome you here this evening. If we haven't met yet, my name is Tom McCall. I serve as the director of the center, and it's on behalf of the center and on behalf of Trinity that I'm, I'm pleased to welcome you. This conversation this evening, as you know, is the end of the Reformation. Tell us our terminus. And uh, this promises to be a very interesting, engaging, lively conversation we'll have tonight on what we all agree, a very important issue and timely discussion of that. Just a couple of notes as we're beginning. Um, two recent books published by uh, both of our conversationalists this evening um, are available with Baker Academic Press and are available on the book table just right out in the foyer. So those are available at 40% off. Uh, you won't find a better deal on really timely and important books. So I encourage you to take a look at that. While you're at those tables, um, Dr. Lightheart has also asked me to mention that he has a sign-up sheet there for the newsletter for the Theophilus Institute. It's on the Henry Center table as you're exiting. It'll be on your right, directly across from the coffee and yummy snickerdoodle cookies. So as you go left to get those, go right and sign his uh, newsletter if you're interested in receiving updates and staying informed about the, the events and happenings and the work of, of that institute. This evening, our discussion will be moderated by Dr. Graham Cole, who is well known to all of us here at Trinity and who serves as professor of biblical and systematic theology and is dean of the Divinity School. So will you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Cole? Well, welcome on this snowy night to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. It's good to see you here. As Tom mentioned, I'll be moderating this evening's civil conversation on that question, the end of Protestantism. Tell us or terminus, or do we have to surrender our Luther is my homeboy t-shirt at the end of the evening? Uh, the format tonight will be an interesting one. Our two speakers will come and join me uh, eventually, so the three of us are here. But in the first instance, I'll be inviting Dr. Van Hooser to speak on the subject of his book, Biblical Authority After Babel, Babel, I, I'm being bilingual, <laughs> Retrieving the Solas in the spirit of mere Protestant Christianity. After he has spoken on that, it'll be Dr. Lightheart's turn, and he will speak on his book, The End of Protestantism, Pursuing Unity in a Fragmented Church. But before I invite Dr. Van Hooser, hereafter Kevin, to speak, let me say a few things about him and also about Dr. Lightheart, hereafter Peter. Uh, Dr. Peter Lightheart, Peter, is president of the Theopolis Institute, you just heard about that, for biblical, liturgical, and cultural studies, and you'll find that institute in Birmingham, Alabama. Kevin Van Hooser, Kevin, research professor in the Department of Biblical and Systematic Theology here at Trinity. Our two luminaries have a lot in common. Both are graduates of Westminster Theological Seminary. Both have PhDs from the University of Cambridge. Both are prolific authors and deep theological thinkers. We don't have mere theologians tonight. Both have wide-ranging curiosity. Not every theologian seems to have that. Dr. Lightheart has written on Jane Austen. Kevin's written on body piercing. <laughs> but especially tonight, the two books I mentioned are on view. So firstly, Kevin will speak, then Peter, and then it'll be uh, Kevin again, speaking on the unity and Catholicity of the church, and then Peter on the same subject. We'll have a bit of change in the furniture up here, and then the three of us will indeed join in a conversation about Protestantism and its future or lack thereof. 
And after that, if there's time, it'll be open for questions uh, from you. And I'll say a bit more about that if we get to that part of the evening and we'll need some directions. Uh, at the very most, 100 minutes for the night. So no need for a sleeping bag. So at this point, I'd like to uh, ask Kevin to come and speak. Thank you. What? No coin toss? <laughs> to determine who gets to kick off and who gets to receive? Uh, clearly, we're playing rugby with Aussie rules tonight, which means no padding, and thus the possibility of bruises, blood, and maybe a chipped tooth. Well, I'm sorry to break it to you if that's what you're here for, because despite the either-or of our symposium title, and the fact that the same publisher released our books on the same day, thus encouraging you to perhaps think conflictually, they're not actually engaged in direct combat. So, the Tellites and the Termites among you, <laughs> put away your vuvuzelas, at least until the second half, during which there may be some conceptual scrums over the meaning of things like unity and Catholicity. I've been asked to speak a little bit about what lies behind the book. And two things prompted it. First, an invitation to give six lectures at Moore College in Sydney. The number six suggested to me that five plus one would do it. And so an introduction and then one lecture on each of the, the solas. So my first lecture introduced the series and I wrote a new conclusion afterwards uh, because I felt it, it was left hanging. But the second factor, the more immediate reason I thought of the solas was that I've been hearing various people say, including evangelical theologians, that on the eve of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, they feel not like celebrating it, but lamenting it. Don't you know that for the 500th anniversary you're supposed to bring platinum, not complaints? So my book addresses this widespread perception that the Reformation was, as President Trump might say, a disaster. Very sad. <laughs> and that's a prevailing narrative. And it highlights the unintended consequences of the Reformation. Things like secularism, skepticism, schism, all these things have been laid at the door of the Reformers, particularly at the door of Sola Scriptura. Stanley Hauerwas identifies Sola Scriptura as the sin of the Reformation. Alistair McGrath calls it Christianity's dangerous idea. And the danger arises from a potent combination of two things, which together proved lethal to medieval society. First, the supreme authority of scripture, but then also the supreme right of individuals to interpret it. Now that's not exactly what Luther meant by the priesthood of believers, but he didn't have copyright on the idea, and it's been taken to mean that after him. Anyway, if we know something by its fruit, then it appears the Reformation must have been rotten at its core, because the fruit appears to be interpretive anarchy and ecclesial chaos, every Protestant for himself. And in this light, the Reformation appears to be a classic legitimation crisis. It's just not clear. In fact, it seems as though they don't have a criterion with which to resolve the conflict of ever proliferating interpretations. Now, I'm not a church historian. I don't pretend to rewrite history either. It is clear that Protestantism has multiplied. It's less clear that it's been fruitful unless you count begetting 30,000 denominations. It's also clear that Protestants, unlike Roman Catholics, don't have an institutional means for arbitrating exegetical disputes. They prefer often simply to retreat to their various confessional castles. And so this is the problem my book addresses. Interpretive babble and what happens to biblical authority after that. Ought we to conclude that 500 years of doctrinal disagreement falsifies the fundamental Protestant premise that the Bible alone is our authority? Again, the history of Protestantism is clear. It's there. It's part of the public record. 
I don't question that. I do, however, question its inevitability. You see, it's a logical fallacy, and even has its own name, post hoc ergo propter hoc. It's a logical fallacy to argue that the interpretive anarchy that followed the Reformation was caused by the Reformation. That's a logical fallacy. So the accidental truths of Protestant history should never become the necessary truths of Protestant theology. My book, again, is not history, but it does go back. It's an attempt to retrieve what I take to be the permanent gain of the Reformation, the five solas. And I want to retrieve the five solas precisely to respond to the problem of interpretive anarchy. By retrieval, I don't mean repeating or replicating. I mean resourcing, looking back in order to find something useful that allows us to move forward. I want to reclaim certain of the reformers' original insights and put them to work on contemporary problems. What we need now, as Protestants needed 500 years ago, is a reforming impulse. And it's this that I find in the constellation of the five solas. I suggest that the solas taken together represent what we might call the first thought theology, the first theology of mere Protestant Christianity. Now, the reformers themselves explicitly named only three solas, gratia, fide, and scriptura. The other two were added a bit later. But my contention is that the substance of what they name, these five solas, these five alones, when we take them together, are distinct ways of speaking about the essential truth of the one gospel. In other words, I'm suggesting we take them together, and I'm suggesting that they aren't simply exclusionary. Yes, it's true that they were protests against some excesses of medieval Roman Catholicism. Scripture alone is authoritative, not tradition. Faith alone is what we need to be justified, not works. Those exclusions are there, but I think behind the exclusions, what they represent is an essentially positive insight, a positive insight into the ontology, epistemology, and teleology of the gospel. I suggest that grace and faith make up the material principle of mere Protestant Christianity, and I suggest that sola scriptura and the priesthood of all believers make up the formal principle of mere Protestant Christianity. And there's a final principle as well, the telos of our symposium title, the telos of mere Protestant Christianity, which is Catholicity. And I associate Catholicity with solus Christus and soli Dei Gloria. So the big idea of the book is to rehabilitate the reputation of sola scriptura, and thus the Reformation, by arguing that when we properly understand it in its connection with the other solas, and when we properly practice it in relation to what Luther really meant by the priesthood of all believers, we do not fall into interpretive anarchy, but in fact discover the way out. I know, I know, it's counterintuitive, but nevertheless, I submit that what many take to be the Achilles heel of Protestantism, sola scriptura, is not a mortal weakness, provided that we keep the heel connected to the rest of the hermeneutical body, the other four solas. These solas summarize what I call the economy of light and life, what the Father is graciously doing in the Son alone, through the Spirit, to form a holy nation, a unified Catholic Church, which is the first fruit of a new creation. So to sum up, my book is about the prospects for biblical authority, especially social uh, sola scriptura, after the babble of conflicting Protestant interpretations. So it's a response to books like Brad Gregory's The Unintended Reformation, but more particularly to Christian Smith's book, The Bible Made Impossible, which is a critique of biblicism. Smith argues that biblical authority on its own generates as many interpretations as there are interpreters, so that biblicism, this appeal to the authority of the Bible alone, biblicism, on his view, becomes incoherent and unsustainable 
and should be abandoned. After all, he says, authority requires definitive instruction and direction, but the Bible's instruction cannot be definitive if the very same passage means different things to different people, the Protestant story. Now, I agree with Smith that contemporary Protestants, and not Protestants only, have to deal with this problem that he has rightly discovered, highlighted, and named pervasive interpretive pluralism. Every self-respecting Protestant wants to be biblical, but Protestants don't have a referee, like Rome does, to arbitrate interpretive disputes. But I think Smith errs in his analysis when, when he includes solo scriptura among the 10 distinguishing marks of biblicism. He says, the significance of any given biblical text, according to solo scriptura, can be understood without reliance on creeds, confessions, historical church traditions, or other forms of theological hermeneutics. I think what's happening here is that he's throwing out the baby of sola scriptura along with the biblicist bathwater. As I said from the same place to a group of free church pastors a few weeks ago, scripture alone authorizes, yet the scripture that authorizes is not alone. Now, this is not some Zen paradox, a koan, just an acknowledgement that sola scriptura is part of a larger pattern of authority, a whole economy of interpretive authority that starts with the Lord Jesus Christ, the font of all authority, but then filters down through his apostles, the disciples, and through other ministerial authorities in the church. So I refuse the caricature of sola scriptura as a blank check that individuals can cash in to fund their own idiosyncratic interpretations of the Bible. Interpretive egoists should not think that they can bypass the pattern of theological authority. So sola scriptura is part of a pattern. And it includes the call to listen for the Spirit speaking in the history of the church's interpretation of Scripture. That's crucial. It also includes the royal priesthood of all believers. Uh, I get that phrase from combining Luther's phrase with 1 Peter 2.9, the royal priesthood of all believers. So far from being a pathology that accords authority to autonomous individuals, this royal priesthood of all believers, the notion that all church members are ministers of God's word, that's actually part of the pattern or economy of authority. Royal signifies authority, after all. Priesthood, I think, names this interpretive community. And all believers says that individuals are not autonomous agents. They're part of a corporation. They're part of a citizenship of the gospel. So the royal priesthood of all believers uh, signals my intent to retrieve not just a principle of authority, the triune God speaking in the scriptures, but also a pattern of authority in which the church figures. The pattern then is an economy that identifies Christ alone as king, but also gives pride of interpretive place to his royal priesthood, not to isolated individuals. So in retrieving this idea of the royal priesthood of all believers, I, I'm pursuing what may amount to a virtual sixth Reformation sola, sola ecclesia, the church alone. Because there is a properly Protestant sense in which the church is alone. It goes like this. The church alone is the place where Christ rules over his kingdom and gives gifts for the building of his living temple. The church alone is that place. So if we're to retrieve the promise of the Reformation and not the pathology, we have to retrieve not merely the idea, but the practice of the royal priesthood of all believers, its particular place in the economy of interpretive authority. And economy is the operative term. There is a divinely ordered pattern that Protestants are to fit into. There's an order. And this pattern helps explain whose biblical interpretation counts, why it counts, and in what way it counts. Well, let me bring this uh, preliminary statement to a close. 
And let me do so by highlighting just one more counterintuitive aspect of my book, namely its insistence that the church uh, is not an element in the economy of interpretive authority only, but a crucial element in the economy of the gospel. The reformers, far from laying the groundwork for modern individual autonomy, were more concerned that individuals become literate citizens of a holy nation. And that means reading the Bible with the temporally extended, socially mediated body of believers. In other words, what I ultimately want to retrieve from the Reformation is their doctrine and best practice of the church. Thanks. And now, Peter, it's your turn. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to the Henry Center for arranging this symposium. Uh, thanks to Dean Cole, hereafter Graham, <laughs> for uh, moderating. I hope uh, we'll remain moderate on our, our own, but it's good to have you here in case. And uh, thanks to Kevin for agreeing to uh, be part of this. Uh, the title of my book is The End of Protestantism, and the title in, has a double meaning. End, of course, means the cessation of something, but end also means the goal or the, uh, the telos, as you have in the title of the symposium. Um, and the, the title is trying to pick up or uh, play on that double meaning of the word end. Uh, and my part of the argument, as I'll explain a little bit more in a second, is that uh, were the Protestants, were the Protestant churches to achieve our end, our aim, our goal, it would mean the end of Protestantism, the cessation of Protestantism, not the cessation of Protestant teaching or the cessation of the solas. Uh, when I talk about Protestantism in the book and in this evening, I'll be talking about a uh, socio-historical reality, an ecclesial histor ecclesio-historical reality, uh, a family of churches that have their roots in the Reformation of the 16th century. And if the church were to be unified and the church, the Catholic church to be reformed as uh, the Protestant reformers intended, there would be no need for a separate family of churches known as Protestantism. So reaching the end means the end of Protestantism. Uh, for me, this started really back in, during my doctoral work at Cambridge. Uh, I was doing some work on the middle chapters of Galatians uh, during, doing a project on uh, baptism uh, and spending a good bit of time in Galatians 2 and uh, grappling with some of the uh, material in Galatians 2 in the light of new perspective on Paul concerns. Uh, and I, I very distinctly remember a moment in the library when uh, it suddenly occurred to me that uh, uh, the question occurred to me, what would happen if Paul were to return to the 20th, at that time, the 20th century church and uh, saw what was happening in the 20th century church. WWPD, what would Paul do? Uh, think, uh, uh, it, uh, keeping in mind what Paul did when he discovered that Peter was uh, refusing to eat with Gentiles in Antioch. Paul becomes apoplectic. Uh, he rages against Peter. He accuses Peter of uh, being false to the gospel. He accuses Peter of violating justification by faith because he refuses to eat together with Gentiles. What would Paul do if he came to the church of the 20th or 21st century? And from that question, I began to see how central the unity of the church is to the entire narrative of scripture and the entire gospel. I think it's fair to say that the gospel is the good news of the reunion of the human race. Uh, the call of Abraham is immediately on the heels of the fragmentation of the human race at the Tower of Babel. Babel. The fragmentation of the human race, the nations are split, their languages are confused, their religions are confused. Uh, and immediately after, God calls Abram as the solution to that problem. He's going to bring blessing to the fragmented nations. And part of that blessing will be to unite them together, at least to the extent that you're united together under the uh, blessing of God. That, of course, is the uh, gospel pre-preached to Abraham, that uh, all the nations will be blessed in you. Uh, that's the gospel that Jesus comes to fulfill in his death, which tears down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile in particular, uh, and by the outpouring of the Spirit, which 
uh, is a reversal of Babel of a sort that reunites nations, another language miracle, uh, not erasing linguistic diversity, but uniting uh, through linguistic diversity. And the church is that one new humanity. The church is, is the reunion of the human race in the present. It's the eschatological human race uh, in the already. Of course, it's important to frame this correctly. Uh, and I think uh, there are moments within the ecumenical movement of the last 150 years where it hasn't been framed correctly, where uh, uni unity, reunion of the churches has been seen as an achievement of human negotiation, achievement of compromise on doctrine or practice. Uh, we have to recognize that unity is God's gift to his church. Any reunion of the churches is God's gift to his church. But I believe that God intends to give it. John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer is not a command to reunite. It's Jesus' prayer that we would be one even as the Father is one with the Son. As the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father, so may the disciples be one. Jesus' prayers don't go unanswered. Uh, this is the future of the new human race. We are going to be united together. We can try to stop it, but we're not going to. Jesus gets what he wants. Our current divisions, therefore, cannot be, cannot be permanent. And we have to not only expect our current divisions and our current fragmentation within the church to be overcome by the Holy Spirit, but we should desire that end. We should desire an end to Protestantism as a separate family of churches, even as we desire an end to Catholicism as a separate church from Orthodoxy and uh, the Protestant churches and whatever else, whatever, whatever category we might include, we should want that end uh, to uh, come to pass as the churches are reunited. Uh, one of the questions that I try to address, I focus in the book on, to keep it uh, somewhat concrete and particular, uh, I focus on uh, American Protestant American Protestantism, American denominationalism. I'm a Protestant speaking primarily to Protestants, so I don't really deal with uh, so much with Protestant Catholic issues, although that's in the background constantly. And I don't try to deal with um, a lot of historical issues uh, that would have uh, enlarged the book uh, immensely and uh, kind of lost focus. And it's not for any uh, uh, parochial reason that I, that I focus on American denominationalism, not because that's the only game or the most important game in town, but it's the one I know best, and so my focus is on that. And the, uh, the, question I, uh, the question I try to address in the sections that deal with um, American denominational Protestantism is uh, the question, basically, aren't we united enough already? Uh, there's a certain kind of consensus among a certain kind of Protestant uh, about some basics of the Christian faith. Isn't that adequate? Uh, and my answer to that is no. And I know this is not so, this is supposed to be an introduction to my book, uh, but just to uh, give a hint of what, uh, what I think is... Uh, a, maybe a contrast that we can talk about later. Uh, Kevin describes Protestantism in terms of a street. He, he picks up on C.S. Lewis's uh, image of the house with many rooms in the hallway and describes it as a neighborhood. Uh, each house is a Protestant church, uh, but you also have a neighborhood life. They meet together and they have cookouts together. They invite each other to their homes. Uh, there is a uh, kind of looming yellow house at the end of the road seven stories, it's the corner of Evangel Way and Tiber Road. Um, and uh, so it's, it's there, the Catholic Church is there. There's a kind of vacant lot at the end with all the non-denominational churches. Um, <laughs> the uh, Orthodox have probably, uh, apparently not yet moved into the neighborhood and, you know, there goes the neighborhood when they do. Um, onion domes everywhere. and So uh, that's, his, that's his picture of uh, Protestantism. Uh, perhaps a picture of Protestantism as it actually is, not as Protestantism as an ideal, but that's a picture of Protestantism. Uh, Kevin somewhat revises Jesus' statement by says, on, on my father's streets, a street are many houses. Uh, which, to my mind, uh, uh, highlights the problem with that picture. And uh, this is a point where I would want to explore with Kevin exactly how he means that picture to be taken. Is it a factual picture of where we actually are? Is it where he wants us to remain? Uh, that's not Jesus' statement, of course. And the picture that we have in the New Testament is not a neighborhood with many different houses, but a household. Uh, we aren't neighbors of one another, but we're brothers and sisters of one another. 
all members of the same household that Jesus has created. Uh, if that's an accurate picture of where we are currently, and I think it is an accurate picture, then that can't be the kind of unity that Jesus is praying for, the kind of unity the New Testament holds out. And I'd also have questions about what to do with the big yellow house at the end of the road, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, so a, a, lot of the, a, lot of my, uh, a lot of the book is an exploration of why that particular picture. I don't use Kevin's uh, book, uh, at, uh, particularly because I hadn't read it at the time I wrote my book. Uh, but I'm, why that picture of Protestantism is not adequate, why that kind of unity, we're all on the same street, we, sh we invite each other over, we share life together. Why is that not an accurate, why is that an, not an adequate form of unity for the Protestant churches? And I again go back to WWPD, what would Paul do if he found churches that were uh, organized by their favorite reformer, you know, organized around their favorite reformer's teaching, uh, or organized around their favorite post-reformer, uh, churches naming themselves by Luther. What would he say to them? Would he repeat some of the things he had already written to the Corinthians? Uh, what would Paul do or what would Paul say if he came to churches and found that we were not sharing uh, the table of Jesus when we gather together? That there are some, uh, even within Protestantism, there are some who refuse to accept other Protestants uh, at uh, the Lord's table. Uh, he was pretty severe with Peter. What would he say to us? Uh, there are, uh, I think there are uh, dynamics within denominational Christianity that uh, uh, create imbalances within the body of Christ. Gifts tend to cluster together. Uh, there's, uh, there are affinity relationships in churches. Uh, we get uh, churches that are uh, all made up almost completely of brains but very few hands and feet. We get churches that are uh, all eyes but no ears, or all mouths and no ears. Everybody has something to say. Uh, nobody is there to listen. We, uh, if you look at the church, step back and look at the church broadly, it looks like a body. If you look at the, a particular denomination, it looks like a, a collection of a single organ. Uh, and that means that there's a certain imbalance within that denomination. And because of denominational uh, differences and, uh, and uh, structures and institutional boundaries, uh, they don't always cross over readily uh, and share their gifts with others. They do, I know, but uh, there are ways, ways in which that's inhibited. Uh, Paul expects the body to share sufferings of one member. Uh, is that possible, realistic in a denominational system? Do we even know the sufferings of other members? I know pastors uh, who uh, tell me uh, that they uh, go for years without meeting the pastor of the church that's across the road from them. Uh, pastors don't know pastors if they're not of the same denomination. They know pastors 100 miles away in their same denomination better than they do the ones next door. Uh, qu a, a question that I would put in terms of uh, Kevin's picture, he talks about a neighborhood watch, that the churches are taking care of what's going on in the neighborhood. I'm, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a good image. It's certainly what the churches should be doing in the current situation. We should commonly take responsibility for what's going on in the neighborhood. Uh, part of my question is, does that actually happen? Is that actually happening? Are there institutional uh, barriers to that actually happening? Uh, and then what happens when there's domestic abuse inside one of the homes? Uh, who takes care of that? Um, the dad's going to stand at the door and say, this is my business, not yours. <laughs> Stay away. Keep out of my house. I think there are institutional uh, barriers to taking responsibility for one another, which is what we're called to do. And denominationalism encourages, I argue, a kind of uh, irresponsibility for the church. Those poor Anglicans, uh, the Anglican community is a mess. I'm glad I'm not part of it. I'm glad I don't have to worry about that. Uh, in fact, of course, we do. Whoever we are, whatever branch of the church we're in, that's our church. Uh, these are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's a suffering of the body uh, and uh, perhaps a, a, a cancer in the body that needs to be repaired. How do we take responsibility for that uh, if we're not in that particular denomination. I do say that against the background of uh, recognizing that there are all kinds of forms of unity and expressions of the unity of the church that do take place within denominational Christianity. Uh, and also the fact that denominational, the, the theorists as it were of denominationalism in, uh, in uh, English history uh, uh, were, uh, had Catholic motivations. They, the reason why they or uh, advocating a kind of denominational system, system was for the sake of Catholicity. 
uh, they were asking the question, how do we, who have different convictions about liturgical practice, governmental uh, polity, doctrinal formulations, how do we live together and recognize each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, as fellow believers, and yet at the same time don't violate our conscience by accommodating to some uh, statement of faith or confession that we don't agree with? How can we balance those two things? And the denominational system is something of a solution to that. Uh, I also recognize that and freely acknowledge and give thanks to God for all the wonderful things that he has done uh, within the denominational, within denominational Christianity in the states and through, the, through American churches around the world. I don't disparage any of that. Uh, and yet I come back to the question, what would Paul do? What would Paul say? Uh, and want to end with uh, reflection, this, just this comment about the moment where we're meeting here this evening. This is Ash Wednesday, uh, beginning of the season of Lent. Uh, and I think that our Protestant celebrations, and they should be celebrations, I agree with Kevin that they should be celebrations, have to be tempered by a Lenten recognition of uh, the uh, havoc that has been caused uh, within the church. Uh, I agree it's not because of the solas, but there's been havoc in the church for the last five centuries. Uh, we should uh, uh, recognize uh, our role in that, um, uh, engage in Lenten self-examination uh, for our, uh, to, to recognize and to repent of our part in the havoc, and all of our celebrations should be tempered by that kind of self-examination and Lenten discipline. Thank you. And now the matter of unity and Catholicity. Kevin. So a few minutes ago, I said that I wanted to retrieve from the reformers their doctrine and best practice of the church. And so that's the question. Should Protestantism figure in the future of the church? Does it have any life in it? This is where our two roads may begin to diverge in a unified wood. Uh, you often hear the phrase that the Reformation is a tragic necessity. Yaroslav Pelikan, I think, introduced that. Um, the, mid the late medieval church needed reforming. Who doesn't? But this particular house cleaning, the Reformation, divided the house. It broke it in two. And uh, the historian Dermot McCullough uses this imagery as the title of his prize-winning history of the 16th century. Reformation. Europe's house divided. And later in the book, he intensifies the rhetoric. He says, if you study the 16th century, you are inevitably present. It's something like the aftermath of a particularly disastrous car crash. All around are half demolished structures, debris, people trying to figure out how to make sense of their lives. That's the aftermath of a tragic event even if it was necessary. Thomas Howard and Mark Knoll put it like this, speaking in our time, in the light of 2017, it seems to us that Protestants are duty-bound to try to understand the tragic dimensions of the Reformation, while Catholics should make the same effort to grasp why Protestants then and now felt that the Reformation was necessary. So 500 years on, Children of the Reformation continue to ask, are we there yet? Peter's saying, not even close. <laughs> is the Reformation over, or are we simply over the Reformation and its divisive concern for establishing doctrines biblically? In any case, the pertinent question is not simply historical. Was the Reformation a mistake, but contemporary? Is Reformation ongoing and still necessary? Spoiler alert. Yes and yes. So I don't dispute that the Reformation was a tragic necessity. Family squabbles are never funny. They're often painful. And divisions in the family of God are most of all to be regretted. Um, nevertheless, I suggest that it may be appropriate to speak not only of the tragic necessity of the Reformation, but also of Protestantism's comic possibility. Think about that. As a literary genre, a comedy is a story of protagonists overcoming obstacles and achieving a successful conclusion, a happy ending. A Reformation is a comic possibility because 
Protestants are working towards that wholeness. A kind of unity, we'll have to discuss more about what kind it is, but I think it's a unity centered not on an imperial structure, the domain of Rome, but an imperial gospel, the domain of God's word. To put it differently, the comic possibility of the Reformation is a distinctly Protestant Catholicity. That's what I'm calling the final purpose of the Reformation, a broader Catholicity normed by Scripture alone. The Catholic Church is the comic possibility of the Reformation. That's what I want us to think about. And not only that, it turns out that the one holy Catholic and apostolic church has an important role to play in this pattern of interpretive authority, which is the main focus of my book. I think Philip Schaff uh, anticipated the comic possibility of the Reformation in his 1844 inaugural address on the Protestant principle at his seminary in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania. I'm sure he woke a few people up when he said that the Reformation was the greatest act of the Catholic Church. And he thought that the greatest threat to the Protestant principle was not the church at Rome, but an exaggerated subjectivism that so focused on an individual's personal relationship with God that it failed to acknowledge the necessity and the objectivity of the church. So for Schaff, the way forward was the marriage of two minds, Protestant and Catholic, small c. Uh, and marriage is, of course, the way good comedies end. Now, for the record, Protestants never wanted a divorce. The Reformation was rather a plea for a deeper and wider kind of Catholicity. Uh, the Lutheran theologian Karl Broughton puts it like this. He said the reformers made their protest against Rome on behalf of the whole church, out of love and loyalty to the truly Catholic church. And after the split came, they continued to work for the reform of the church. He goes on, the Reformation was a movement of protest for the sake of the one church. We need to appreciate this. The reformers' main objection to the late medieval Roman Catholicism of their day was not to its Catholicity, but to the narrow focus on Rome. This is exactly what Calvin says in his 1539 letter to Cardinal Sadole. He says, our agreement with antiquity is far closer than yours. All we have attempted has been to renew the ancient form of the church. We need to let that sink in, because both Luther and Calvin have a high regard for Catholic tradition, as long as that Catholicity is defined not by Rome, but by Romans. That is the gospel. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's what Paul did say, <laughs> Romans 1.16. Luther doesn't violate Sola Scriptura then when he acknowledges the usefulness of church councils, provided that they're truly Catholic. A Pelican summarizes Luther's position like this. He says, as a Protestant, he subjected the authority of church councils to the authority of the Word of God. As a Catholic, he interpreted the word of God in conformity with the dogmas of the councils. Catholic substance and Protestant principle belong together. That's a comic possibility, the marriage of two mentalities. Nor does Calvin violate Sola Scriptura when he encourages individuals to submit their biblical interpretations, quote, to the judgment of the church, as Scripture portrays the church as the sum total of local congregation Whose God, where God's word is rightly preached and the sacraments rightly administered. Another historian, John McNeil, looks at the reformers, like Calvin and Melanchthon and Martin Bucer, Cranmer, and he's impressed by what he calls their unitive Protestantism. I think they were mere Protestant Christians before the term had been invented. It was almost there. I mean, Lewis took the term mere from Richard Baxter, who preferred to think of himself as a mere or Catholic Christian rather than use one of the uh, more fashionable designer Protestant labels that was uh, available at the time. And Lewis says that it is at her center where her truest children dwell 
that each communion is really closest to each other in spirit, if not in doctrine. This is part of what this mere Protestant Christianity vision entails. Mere Protestants care about doctrine, especially first order doctrine. They care about getting scripture right. And they have strategies for getting scripture right, but it involves unity and Catholicity, church councils, and canonical conference similar to what we see in Acts 15, where the whole church comes together to try and reach a common mind about an important issue pertaining to the gospel and its implications. So mere Protestant local churches in the same way have an obligation to read in communion, not only with one another in the local church, but with the saints in other local churches, as well as with the church from other times. Again, this is part of the pattern of interpretive authority. We can't completely divorce the supreme authority of Scripture from the interpretive community in which it's read and in which it rules. So my point is that I think the future of Protestantism, if it is going to be towards a mere Protestant Christianity, is going to be a future where canonicity and Catholicity are equally ultimate. Now, I can't do justice to it here, but let me simply say that the gist of the constructive part of my book uh, tries to counter uh, Christian Smith's pervasive interpretive pluralism with a unitive interpretive plurality. Did you hear the contrast? A unitive interpretive plurality. I think that's the hallmark of a mere Protestant Christianity. And I conclude the book by throwing a googly at the reader that's Australian, I think, for curveball. Um, when I suggest that the, uh, the genius and glory of mere Protestant Christianity uh, is, comes to, to its fullest realization in the transdenominational, transnational movement named evangelicalism. I thought readers would be shocked by that idea because I carefully resisted using the word evangelical until about two, page 214. And uh, so to anticipate and tip my hat that I knew readers would be shocked, I entitled that section, and in the morning, behold, it was Leah. <laughs> and I know this is counterintuitive too, because evangelicalism has become a fractious, vociferous movement, even though it began as a renewal movement of confessional Protestantism. Renewal without a direct object, though, and sometimes evangelicals try to get renewed and excited about nothing in particular. Uh, renewal without a direct object is not a successful, sustainable practice. That's energy poorly spent. And to make matters worse, the visible church has become for many evangelicals a matter of secondary or incidental importance. But without any institutional means to deal with difference, without the royal priesthood of all believers, evangelical cells, local churches, simply continue to split, generating division and disunity, and become a cancer in the body of Christ. So my call for a mere Protestant evangelicalism, a reforming Catholicity centered on the gospel, is an attempt to stop the bleeding. I agree with Peter, there is a big problem in the present. Uh, again, by retrieving the solas as guidelines and guardrails of biblical interpretation, and as I've said, by retrieving the royal priesthood of all believers, the place of the church and the pattern of interpretive authority. So a mere Protestant Christian is not only a person of one book, but also a person of one church. Scripture is never alone in one sense because it's never without the communal domain over which it rules, the people of God. And that's why Catholicity belongs in this pattern of theological authority. Uh, minimally, as the context for reading scripture. Maximally, as a first earthly step in God's triune mission to unite all things in Christ. The church's Catholicity, the scope of the company who've been incorporated into Christ, is a parable of the cosmic unity that will obtain in the, God, in the kingdom of God. So mere Protestant Christianity uses the resources of the solas and the priesthood of all believers to express this 
unity and denominational diversity that local churches have in Christ. And it does call churches to enact in demonstrable and tangible ways the oneness for which Jesus prayed as evidence of the gospel's truth. So I see the solas as seeds for a perennial reformation of the church. The kind of Protestantism that I want to survive is uh, not the tragic caricature that encourages individual autonomy or not the de facto uh, situation that we have where Protestantism becomes a, an occasion for corporate pride. No, the Protestantism I want to survive and flourish is the Catholic original that encourages the church to hold fast to the gospel and to one another in Christ. Put it this way, the only good Protestant is a Catholic Protestant, one who learns from and bears fruit for the whole church. So we're 500 years on, and there are seeds for a truly unitive Protestantism that have germinated, but they've yet to mature into the measure of the full stature of Christ. But I think we can and sing and should sing sola with expectant joy rather than lament, although I agree there is a place for repentance, for unnecessary divisions. By God's grace, mere Protestant Christianity may well be a fresh blowing of the Holy Spirit, a ressourcement of both the Protestant and Catholic principles, a retrieval that enables the lion of biblical fidelity, sola scriptura, to lie down with the lamb of ecclesial fraternity, sola ecclesia. So friends, I think the future of Protestantism is the future of the reforming Catholic Church, the church conceived but not yet delivered by the reformers 500 years ago. Thanks. Peter, it's uh, your turn. Whether there'll be a googly or not, I'm not sure. Well, it's clear uh, with Kevin's talk of marriages and comedy that he hasn't spent all his time thinking about body piercings. Uh, he, has, he has taken some time to read some Jane Austen, fortunately. It's good to know. Uh, very little almost nothing that I would disagree with in, in that. Uh, very much agree with the uh, comic possibility of a Catholic Protestantism. I've been calling it Reformational Catholicism, uh, but I think there's a lot of overlap in the vision of what we hope for. Uh, what I want to do is uh, provide some uh, suggestions for thinking that that comic possibility is a real possibility. And uh, I do this with the recognition that it's very easy to uh, cherry pick the evidence that supports my uh, dreams and hopes. So uh, I, that whatever I say has to be qualified by a recognition of the limitations of my, of my knowledge and uh, the, the tendency to focus in on things that will support my own thesis. Uh, but let me set a biblical framework for, uh, and I do this in the book, a biblical framework for thinking about where Protestantism, where the church as a whole is in the present time. Uh, biblical history is not seamless. There are endings and new beginnings within biblical history. There are transi transitions, deaths and resurrections. There are uh, erections and dismantling of various orders and worlds. Uh, and at each transition, uh, I argue in the book, uh, there are three things that happen, probably more that you could isolate in this recurring pattern in the Bible. There's a change in a liturgical form uh, within Israel, I'm talking about Old Testament history primarily. There's a reorganization of the internal order of Israel, and then there's a change in relationship between Israel and the rest of the nations. The kind of change in liturgical order that I'm talking about is the kind of change that takes place after the tabernacle is demolished by the Philistines, not rebuilt, but eventually gets incorporated into a temple system which is different 
the temple itself is a physically different object, a physically different building than the tabernacle. Uh, there are changes in the uh, organization of the priests. There's changes in the worship of Israel. Much more prominence given to uh, worship uh, by song and by music. Uh, you have a continuity with discontinuity. There's uh, a change in priesthood that takes place uh, as you move from the tabernacle to the temple. And you go to, from the temple to the second temple or the temple into the exile. You have something even more. You have a temple-less form of worship during the time of the exile, which is uh, uh, pretty rare in the ancient world. You also have an internal reorganization of Israel. Uh, you move from the Mosaic era during the time of the, the judges, for example, when the, uh, you had this tribal system, only an ad hoc unity when there was a threat. A judge would, the Lord would raise up a judge and you would have a gathering of an army that would fight against the threat and resist the threat. But you go from that tribal system and a kind of ad hoc leadership, military leadership, to a much more uh, established military leadership with the monarchy, uh, much more organized, not quite a standing army, but a much more organized military force, uh, and a, an Israel that's divided by administrative districts. If you look at the uh, description of Solomon's kingdom in First Kings, you'll find that the administrative districts of Solomon's kingdom don't match up with the uh, tribal areas. You have these overlapping jurisdictions now. You still have tribes operating, but you have administrative districts. And you have a, you have a shift in uh, it, the internal organization of Israel. At each stage, you also have a shift in Israel's relationship to the nations. Uh, Israel's relationship to the nations under the kings is different from what it was under Moses and under the Mosaic system. Uh, you have a court to which kings from other lands can come. Solomon holds court with the Queen of Sheba and many other kings who come to hear his wisdom. Uh, after Israel's monarchy collapses and you move into the exilic and post-exilic period, uh, for the last portion of the Old Testament, Israel is under Gentile rulers. They're a, a client state uh, of the uh, Persians who let them go back, and then they're under various uh, Hellenistic rulers before they become uh, a, a uh, province or uh, of, of the Roman Empire. So you have a, different, a, diff a change in the relationship between Israel and the nations. Uh, what, uh, what I'm suggesting uh, is that we can see some of these same, uh, I'm suggesting first of all that this pattern of death and resurrection, this pattern of formation and, de and destruction and reformation is characteristic of uh, the church's history. Uh, that, that that sort of pattern continues in the history of the church and the same sorts of things happen at each of these transition points. Um, you, it, as you move from one order of things to another, you have a change of worship, you have a change in the internal organization of the church now, and you have a change in the relationship between church and world. Uh, I'm arguing in the book that there's a, there are uh, shifts going on in each of these areas in the last 150 years that suggest that we're in the midst of some kind of epical transition, not only in the church, but in the, in the entire uh, kind of geopolitical order. Uh, I can highlight some uh, bits of evidence, and again, these, these are bits of evidence, and I acknowledge that I could be cherry-picking things that support my, my own inclinations. Uh, but in the, the church world relation, it's pretty clear that we have a different kind of uh, uh, relationship between church and polity than we had even as recently as the mid-19th century. You still had thrown in altar systems, thrown in altar regimes in Europe in the, into the 19th century. Uh, in the United States uh, up until it depends on where you want to date it, perhaps up until the early 20th century, maybe it's the mid-20th century, you had uh, an informal Protestant establishment that is just absolutely gone. Uh, doesn't, there's, no, there's no Protestant center to the American uh, system anymore. Uh, in those two areas you have, uh, in Europe and uh, in North America, you have uh, a significant shift in the relationship between the church and the nations in which it exists. And then you have the, the, the global shift from uh, uh, the, the northern to the southern hemisphere, which also has massive political implications. I think probably the most significant uh, shifts are taking place, uh, the ones that I highlight in the book, are taking place internally within the church. Within the United States, and again, I focus on that for pra pragmatic reasons, just to keep some specificity to the argument. Uh, within the United States, the denominational system that has governed uh, and gone through various phases uh, is certainly in disarray in various ways in the present. Uh, denominational boundaries have become porous. You don't have the same kind of denominational loyalties that you used to have. Uh, 
uh, cross-denominational marriages are much more common than they used to be. Uh, people will move from one city to the other. Part of it is a matter of mobility, uh, moving from one city to another, and they'll just change denominations without uh, much of a thought about it. Uh, denominational boundaries become more porous, and that system seems to be weakening. Um, you also have, importantly, denominational denominations fractured internally. Uh, this is a point that Robert Wuth now made many years ago about the restructuring of American religion. And you have, instead of having Presbyterians kind of cluster together as a Presbyterian quadrant of American Christianity, Presbyterianism itself is split up in various ways. And certain Presbyterians have more affinity with conservative Lutherans or even conservative Catholics, or in some cases even conservative Orthodox, especially on moral issues, uh, than they do with fellow Presbyterians. So those internal fracturing of the denominations, I think, are significant. Uh, you have new churches, not only in the uh, global south, but you also have new churches that are arising within North America and the West as immigrants come in, plant churches all over the place. Uh, many of the, many of the uh, most vibrant churches in London these days are not, uh, are not uh, part of the Church of England or planted by English people at all. They're planted by immigrants mostly from Africa. Um, some of them come in as immigrants to find work. African Christians wherever they go, tend to be missionaries, and so they're planting churches. You have new churches. Uh, it used to be roughly uh, accurate to say that Christianity was divided between Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox. Uh, Pentecostalism kind of spoiled that neat triadic diagram. Where do they fit? Are they Protestants? Uh, and then you have all of the various movements of <laughs> different degrees of Orthodoxy that are arising within the global south. What do you do with those? How do those fit into question of the future of the church. That's another indication of the unraveling of what used to be a fairly, or at least appear to be a fairly neat, uh, a fairly neat uh, uh, classification of Christians. Uh, Catholic and Protestant divisions have weakened, and uh, there have been various initiatives, starting with, uh, maybe starting with Vatican II, uh, certainly a huge impetus in, at Vatican II uh, for the Catholic Church to engage with Protestants and other separated brethren, and uh, much more camaraderie, uh, both at uh, that kind of high level and also, as uh, Charles Colson said, uh, an ecumenism of the trenches. I think perhaps one of the, one of the main uh, signs of this shifting internal to the church has been the, uh, the invasion of orthodoxy into uh, the West. You, know, you have Russians that, are moving, that moved into the West because of Soviet oppression and the invasion of Orthodox theology into Western theology. Um, everybody reads Orthodox theologians these days, and that, was, that would not have been the case uh, 100 years ago among Protestants or Catholics. There's a great deal more cross-fertilization, and in some ways Orthodoxy will cut through some of the, some of the issues that have divided, traditionally divided Protestants and Catholics in, and provide some fresh ways of thinking about issues that divide us. This is all tumultuous. I, I think we, I could go on to talk about liturgical changes and the, the liturgy wars that go on everywhere. That would be another signal of uh, uh, the Lord taking hold of a world that is, uh, was, was formed in, uh, in the 16th century, uh, tearing that world apart, starting to put the world back together in new ways. Uh, what I see there, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of congenitally uh, oriented toward comedy, uh, what I see there is a comic possibility that the Lord is working to re, uh, reconfigure the church uh, and to put things, put the pieces back together in, in new ways. One of the recurring uh, themes within the Bible, when you look at these uh, patterns of, of uh, death and resurrection, uh, one, of the, one of the key lessons, I think, is that the resurrected form is never a resurrection of what, uh, what it replaces. The tabernacle is not the temple. Post-exilic uh, Israel is not the same as pre-exilic Israel. Um, the Davidic, Davidic dynasty is not the same as the Mosaic dynasty. There's, there's, uh, there's something new that takes place, something new that's brought into place, uh, brought into play. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a mistake for any, uh, any church to think that the future is everyone gathering back into a particular fold, uh, you know, everyone gathering back into Rome, everyone becoming Orthodox, or uh, the pro Protestantism trying to shore up and retain uh, what it has been. Uh, I, I endorse uh, uh, Kevin's uh, work of retrieval, and he's not alone in that. There's a lot of work being done along those lines. 
But as Kevin says, and most of the people who work in this area say, the retrieval is always for the sake of some future, uh, some future ministry. It's not simply a, ma a matter of recover, uh, recovering and trying to re, uh, rebuild in uh, something that uh, that uh, is just something that was uh, 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 that has already been torn down. I have some practical suggestions, but I won't go into them. Uh, but let me just end with this comment that. Uh, let me, I guess, to summarize, just to make, make it clear what I'm trying to say here. All of these changes are taking place. I think these are uh, potential signals that the Lord is at, at work. I think there are certainly signals that the Lord is at work. Uh, and part of what he's at work doing is uh, reconfiguring the church in the present day. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to pursue an, a fresh kinds of unity within the church, uh, fresh forms of reform, as Kevin was talking about, uh, that uh, might not have been possible in in, uh, in prior centuries when the when the when the form of the church was more settled. Uh, the question I think comes, does come down to the, how we're oriented and what stance we're taking in relation to Jesus' program and blueprint for the church. Are we oriented? We don't bring the unity of the church, but are we oriented in our practices? Is our theologizing or our churches oriented uh, toward? Uh, unity of the church, or are they oriented to maintain our turf and to maintain the divisions that have plagued us? Thank you. Friends, we now move into the uh, next part of what we're doing together, which is to have a conversation, especially between Kevin and Peter, and I must <coughs> inject a few things here and there, and uh, leave uh, a little bit of time for a question from, from you. But I thought I might uh, start off by asking both Kevin and Peter, um, is there an important distinction between Sola Scriptura and Nuda Scriptura. Uh, the distinction I think you're probably familiar with, and uh, is there an important nuance that needs to be brought out at that point? Uh, yes, there is an important <laughs> distinction. Thank you. Now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, w I want to correct the misimpression that sola scriptura means that people can read the Bible on their own without any instruction or guidance from the church or church tradition. So I think I said scripture alone authorizes, but the scripture that authorizes is not alone. So it's not just scripture. There are other authorities in the pattern of authority, uh, ministerial authorities that help us get scripture right. And I think the ascended Christ gave <coughs> gifts to the church, so we're told in Ephesians 4, and one of those gifts was teachers. So even teachers helping us to read would be part of the pattern of authority. They don't have supreme authority like scripture, but I think um, it's not just us and the Bible. That is an individual in the Bible. We're part of a broader pattern. This is the way in the economy of authority, the spirit directs the church into all truth, I think. The very fact that we can read our Bibles in English shows our indebtedness, doesn't it? Uh, would you like to comment too, uh, Peter? I uh, don't think I have anything to add. I would agree with that. Well, that was simple. Um, I wonder if there's something that you'd like to say to one another oh, in the yes. light of what well, <laughs> you... I think the answer is yes. So uh, over to you, Peter. Okay. Um, well, let me first say uh, there's uh, a great deal in the book that I like, and I could spend all my time talking about the, the things that I liked about the book. Um, I, I really appreciated the way that you described this soul as a, particularly as a package. Um, uh, as I, I'm uh, altogether in favor of a, an additional sola with Ecclesia at the end. Mm -hmm. um, I think you should be nominated for a Nobel Prize in economics after your uh, hard work on economy. Um, <laughs> and I also appreciated the uh, the emphasis, uh, practical emphasis on food processing, which I think is certainly a, a crucial element of uh, any pursuit of reform and uh, any for reform that's going to lead to a certain kind of unities, emphasizing the importance of unity of the Lord's Supper. Um, one of the questions I have, though, is 
uh, has to do with the uh, uh, the fissiparousness of Protestantism. I'm going to stipulate that we're going to call this the fis. Um, if that doesn't just get funny, I want to. That word is just too long to keep saying. Um, you're defending the solas from the charge that they're responsible. That this this these teachings of Protestant churches are responsible for the fragmentation of the church. Uh, what I don't see is an alternative account of why we are in the situation that we're in. And I have a couple of specifics that might help to uh, uh, tease out uh, some of the things I'm thinking. Um, you're defending the original Catholic vision of the Reformers. You say at one point in the book that they have, they're not just a negative gesture, but it's a positive program, which I agree with. Um, you, you'd attribute that positive program to Protestantism and then immediately say, the Reformers thought. But the Reformers were the origin of a Protestant movement that took different forms, even within the century after, the, after Protestantism began. So what about, what about later Protestantism? Uh, maybe particularly how uh, are the, even, even as early as the mid, well, even as early as the uh, first few decades of the Reformation, um, are the Reformers handling their differences in a way that's uh, consistent with your vision of Protestant Catholicity. Are there things very early, and obviously I'm thinking about the Eucharistic debates in the 1520s, as early as the 1520s. Uh, later in the 16th century, these get hardened into uh, confessional differences. Um, uh, you know, that, that would be one particular episode or set of episodes to ask the question, is the, is the Reformation going wrong here, and why is it going wrong? Um, and, let, uh, and, let, and just a, one more uh, example of what I'm talking about. Um, you talk about the gospel articulated by the, by the Protestant confessions at, at a couple of points. But I wonder if we need to think again about what those confessions are doing within their historical context. One point of, one point of a confession is to bring unity. I mean, the, the various Lutheran confessions of the 16th century are an effort to, to unify the different pro, uh, Lutheran factions. Mm -hmm. Certainly the case with uh, many of the Reformed confessions. Reformed churches cross-acknowledge uh, the, uh, the confessions of other churches. At the same time, Lutheran confessions are set up, taught, theologized on, in a way uh, that emphasizes the difference not only from Catholics, but from other Protestants, from Reform. Uh, and uh, Reform, perhaps to a lesser extent, are doing the same. So our, our uh, confessions, or maybe the way that confessions have been used historically, might they be part of the problem? So those are all specific questions about uh, under the heading of what, what is your alternative account of why, why the Protestants fragmented? Right. So I think in general, your strength is the descriptive detail you give. You, you get dirty into sociology, into history, and so you have a lot of stories to tell that back <laughs> up your point that are true. I'm, I'm not necessarily an idealist, but I think I'm offering a normative account. Yeah. So you're, right. you're rightly pointing out the fact that history didn't go the way I wanted it to go. <laughs> Why not? And I, I think the simple answer is, you know, we're fallible human beings. Worse than that, we're sinners. So we not only see part of the truth, right. we still resist the truth. I, I think pride entered in very quickly. Uh, there was... There were several attempts, real attempts, where people wanted to overcome some of the differences. I'm thinking Lutheran and Reformed in particular on the mm, Lord's yes, Supper. Sir. Melanchthon was more uh, committed to that project than Luther for whatever reason. Um, and they got close and then there was uh, maybe stubbornness. So, I, and I say this first of all because I recognize it in myself. Mm. I, I recognize, and this is where I think you're, you're right to call Protestants out when we speak of an ism, we're speaking of an ideology. Mm. So I, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the term ism. I think I try to use ITY instead of <laughs> ISM as often as I could because uh, an ism misdirects our attention. We should be all about worshiping and following the Lord. Mm. When we call a set of ideas an ism, we've objectified it and then we suddenly have to defend it. Yeah. So I think, um, and maybe that's connected with the question about the confessions. Right. I think the confessions were necessary to garner unity at a particular place in time, mm -hmm. but then when people from other places, if they're forced to subscribe, then it, it's not really doing the same type of work and it becomes more of, a, of an ideological instrument rather than a confession. 
So I think, I think that's my answer. And yeah. then, but you might ask, so do I have any more hope that we can avoid those same uh, problems yeah, sure. now? And I think I, there I would have to agree with you and say, the first thing we have to do is pray. And then I think you've also pointed out the importance of repentance in ecumenical discussions, at least the, the preparedness to repent if we think we've got it wrong or uh, that we've misheard people. So I think you mentioned some of the things I would want to stress. Uh, prayer, listening, humility, but this is part of sanctification as a process anyway, and Protestantism is only 500 years old. Yeah, right. <laughs> Cut it some slack. That's right. <laughs> oh, still an infant. May I, could mind, and I, yeah, yeah, I just want to make, make one point. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not going to, uh, uh, I'm not going to demand an answer to this, but I think the part of the point of pursuing it is to, precisely to, to fill out the question, or fill out what you said. So it's on account of sin, agreed. What sort of sin, and did these sins uh, lead to institutional patterns and habits and practices mm -hmm. that actually facilitate okay. and, and perpetuate disunity? Yeah, so in other but, words, is a denomination a concretization of a sin? Right, right. So in, in knowing what the sin was would be, seem yeah. to be important for, okay. for uh, repenting of it. May I ask, uh, what would this reformed Catholic church actually look like, empirically speaking? Yeah. Kev uh, Kevin and then Peter. Well, I'm, I uh, like what Timothy George says about evangelicalism as a renewal movement within historic confessional Protestantism. So I think one can be what I'm calling a reformational Catholic and stay in one's denomination. And I think that's where we might have a, a difference of a, of a view. But going ahead into the future, mm. what would this worldwide ah, right. phenomenon look like? Yeah. Well, I, I can uh, address that in a couple ways. I think the, the, first, thing, uh, the first thing I would want to say uh, sounds like a dodge, but it, it's not. And that is, I don't know. <laughs> and I say that as a, out of theological conviction that um, Robert Jensen says, God is a living God, and therefore he surprises. Uh, he does things that we can't anticipate. And that was part of, the, part of the pattern I was describing from the Old Testament, that there are, uh, could, could uh, a, uh, uh, a, a, an Israelite living at the time of the Mosaic Tabernacle, when the Mosaic Tabernacle is being dismantled, could he have anticipated that the future would look like a temple and that it would look like a capitals? You know, uh, perhaps, but that's kind of outside the outside, outside the can. In, in some fundamental ways, we don't know, and I think we have to be faithful. And the Lord will is part of being uh, recognizing that the unity is a gift of God. But having said that, I, I do have an answer to the question. Uh, there are various models I could think of. I mean. Uh, uh, the Anglican Communion, for example, with all its problems, is a recognizable international global phenomenon, a, a global church, uh, with a complex pattern of authority, a complex array of authority, a complex array of national churches, and so on, but still is a recognizable global communion. Uh, something, something along those lines on a, on a global scale might be part of it, might be one model. It could be uh, something more metropolitan and patriarchal like the Eastern churches, where you have... Uh, Churches that are gathered in particular regions with uh, some uh, some regional leadership, but le regional leaderships that's cooperating with others, with other regional leaders that form a network of uh, regional churches. Uh, the the particular pol the particular uh, polity arrangements I think could could vary, but I can I think the Anglican Communion maybe is the best concrete example we have today of what it might look like on a global scale. Well, that may ask. not be encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, it's Structurally, just Structurally, like, I mean, uh, I don't mean the... As an Anglican, I've always been encouraged by 1 Corinthians, which is still the Church of God at Corinth. <laughs> um, but yes, may sir. I ask, one's expectations of how this might be realized empirically, to what extent are they informed by one's eschatology? Mm. So if one has um, a pessimistic eschatology, a millennial, premillennial of various kind, I think that might lead to expectations tempered. Yeah, per, yeah, because if one has a postmillennial eschatology, then there may be more uh, optimism. Yeah. Who'd like to comment on yeah, that? 
I, I, I think that's exactly right. And I'm, I'm uh, post-millennial. I'd want to describe what I mean by that, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll accept the label. And that does certainly figure into how I'm thinking about the unity of the church, and particularly th thinking about, I, I, think I, I think this is exegetically defensible, but uh, I know that it's affected by my overall eschatological outlook. Uh, what kind of conclusions I draw from John 17. Um, when Jesus prays for the unity of the church, is he, is he pray and it's obviously a visible unity, something that uh, the world can see and know that the Father sent the Son. Uh, but is he talking about something that is a, um, as, as an eschatological reality, the, un the final unity of the New Jerusalem? Or is he talking about something that, but that's realized in some necessarily imperfect way in history? Uh, and I think I, I, I can make an exegetical case for the latter, but I know that that's, that's affected by my overall eschatological view. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. What about you, Kevin? Uh, yes, without even getting into the millennial position, I think eschatology makes a difference. I, I want to say that the church is one, united in Christ. But when I say is, it's not the empirical is, it's the eschatological is, the already not yet is. But I do want to underline the already bit. We, we can't unify the church. The, you know, Christ has called the church. We're seated in the heavenlies. So I want to say, we're in one sense, we're there. In another sense, we're not there yet. Right, I agree with that. Uh, just one more comment. No, I, I don't have another comment. I just I don't want to take over the moderation, but Kevin didn't have a chance to ask me a question. I'm oh. sure you're getting ready to let me. Please. <laughs> um, so you wanted me to be cl as clear as I could about the sort of sin, yeah. and I sort of was. <laughs> uh, but uh, I want to ask you if you can be clear about the sort of unity you're after. Yeah. Um, the kind that Jesus is praying about in John 17 arguably is a kind of maybe a perichoretic, mutual yes. indwelling in love. I can, uh, I can and, uh, okay, uh, but but then, you know, are, do we have that? Uh, it seems as though you're pressing towards something more visible, organizational. Uh, you've had some interesting quotes describing it. One used the term faces. Do you remember that one? I think I have it written down somewhere. It will, be the unit, it will not be the unity of a faceless bureaucracy, but a unity of human faces, mm. a prosopological unity. <laughs> and, I'm just, and again, I'm trying to work out in, in the flesh what that looks like. Mm. What kind of a unity would you be happy, or are you going for? Yeah. How do we express that kind of unity? Right. Well, um, yeah, I, I, it is a perichoretic unity. I think that's an accurate description. Um, and, uh, but I think that, that ha again, just in, within the passage, within the prayer, it's a unity that has to be evident, and not just evident by faith, but it's evident to the world. This is part of the proof that the, the Father sent the Son, um, that the world may know. So uh, that has to be expressed in some kind of visible way. But why couldn't denominational cooperation be that expression? Yeah. Uh, if denominations cooperated perichoretically and actually indwelt one another and actually served one another and the unity of denominations was actually a unity like the unity of Father and Son, um, that, that could be one expression, one way that the church could be unified. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't believe that that's how denominations operate. Uh, that there, are, there, are certainly, there are certainly aspects of denominational life or, or life of the church within a denominational order certainly aspects of the life of the church where that happens. Uh, churches, churches do common projects, do, churches do common acts of worship. Uh, but uh, there, as a, part of my argument is that there are institutional inhibitions, institutional barriers to a full mutual indwelling participation. I think because of those, because of denominational loyalties and boundaries, uh, there's just a, uh, uh, it, it, uh, the, the structure of the church present, prevents and stands in the way of that kind of perichoretic unity. Like, uh, the example, I, a, I don't have a particular example, but I, I do know uh, pastors who had to take the time and hadn't done to go and meet pastors. Um, you know, how many churches, uh, how many of the churches that we go to um, pray for members of other churches in the neighborhood? And not just generically by the name of the church, but know what's going on in those other mm -hmm. churches so that they can pray for the needs of those other churches. How many, how many pastors call 
two pastors during the week and ask for uh, things that they can pray for at their prayer meeting. So I get my concern still is I, I, I'm uncomfortable thinking of unity as uniformity. Sure. Um, when I listen to music, I can take Gregorian chant for a while, it's unison, <laughs> but after a while I want harmony. And it's one piece and yet there's diversity in it. So I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, couldn't there be a kind of unity in diversity? And then if so, what kind of unity, what kind of diversity? For example, we're here at a chapel of a seminary that is affiliated with the Evangelical Free Church of America. Uh, Dr. Kotzer, one of the founding deans of its modern iteration, uh, described Trinity, this institution, as a love gift from the Evangelical Free Church of America to the broader Evangelical Church. And I, I, I like that notion. Um, it's one reason why I'm here, to be honest. And there are many people from different denominations in this place and, but on the other hand, um, I would be reluctant if some denomination weren't here. I, my, imagine you had a, uh, the ability to get rid of a denomination or to incorporate it fully into yours. You could push a button and make all Lutherans Presbyterians. Um, I'm not sure I would want to press the button because I think in, in, in the best case scenario, every denomination could be a love gift. That's, that's the best scenario. Yeah. But what I mean is there are certain insights that seem to be peculiar to denominations. And if we could pool our insights, it seems like the church would be more Catholic than if we had a kind of unity where there weren't these denominations. Right. Now, so the question is, do you have a way of preserving diversity if denominations disappear? Yeah. Well, um, do I have a way to do that? I don't, I don't, I don't think I do. I can, I can make a... I can make a stipulation that uh, I'm not talking about uniformity. I'm, uh, inevitably, you're talking about a church that has all kinds of variation in it. I mean, you, think, you know, uh, the church at Pentecost is a church unified by the Spirit, um, but it's a church that's unified by the Spirit with multiple languages, which means multiple cultural expressions. At least you have the plurality and diversity of cultures. Yes. You don't have a uniform... Uh, uh, culturally uniform expression of Christianity, um, and I don't th that's that's not the that's not the the vision of Pentecost or the the promise of Pentecost. So I can stipulate that as theological. Do I have do I have built-in controls in what I'm advocating? I I don't think I have anything like that. Um, but uh, you know, I think the uh, the the kind of um, yeah the kind of church that I hope for would be the kind of church you're describing, which has the, the best of all uh, the different, uh, what, what are diff currently different denominations. Mm -hmm. The best expressions of Christianity in those denominations are coming to expression in some kind of, uh, uh, in some kind of, uh, 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 in some kind of unified way. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that it, it, this may be a point of difference. Uh, you make a distinction between local and universal and say that the, of an uh, order is a matter uh, for the local church, if I remember rightly, and faith is the level of expression of unity in the universal church. Uh, I have, I'm skeptical that that is actually practically workable. And at least, in, I don't want to turn this into a question back at you, but it leads me to wonder uh, again about what, what, it wasn't clear to me what you were advocating be done uh, when you have uh, uh, churches that uh, get things wrong. Um, how are those dealt with? Um, and it's hard to imagine that they be that they would be dealt with without some kind of institutional framework for dealing with them. Um, you talk uh, in the book several times about a, a conciliar uh, emphasis of early Protestantism, but uh, it's been a long time since Protestants have had a church council um, on, on the scale that they were having them in the 16th, 17th centuries. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 that that kind of uh, I could see a, a, a council or even a even something a smaller scale dealing with it, but uh, it, it's hard to me, hard to see how you could have correction without some kind of institutional structure that's facilitating that. Yeah, I think that's a hard question for any ecclesiology. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how that, how it plays out in your reformational yeah. Catholicity yeah. either, um, but. We do have some examples, I'm thinking of the Lausanne Covenant, where there are many people who voluntarily covenant together, and 
I guess maybe even the National Association of Evangelicals, there'd be some kind of disciplinary, even if it were only prophetic, maybe not a kingly office, but a prophetic witness mm -hmm. that the, um, the majority group in the covenant could use uh, with a rogue church. Mm -hmm. I might at this point say that we've really run out of time. I think I could ask questions of our two um, theologians all night. Um, it's good being the person who's the moderator because I get the last word. Folk who have a question, I'm, I'm sure our friends here may have some time after that you might be able to approach them and ask the question. Um, I must say that uh, when I read my New Testament, uh, I wonder if we could do some theological work with the Pauline notion of the right hand of fellowship. Because the church in Jerusalem was a very different uh, looking way of doing church to the Pauline churches. And one wonders, even in the Pauline churches, if 1 Corinthians actually worked the same way as the churches in Crete, for example. No mention of uh, elders or deacons in 1 Corinthians. So the right hand of fellowship would be worth exploring, I think, as a, a notion. And I also wonder about economy of scale. Uh, democracy in Athens was much easier than in America with 300 plus million people. And I wonder to what degree uh, splintering, people not knowing each other, or what's, not, what's happening in other places has to do with economy of scale. Friends, thank you, and let's thank our two theologians. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.